I'd like to call the April 16th meeting of the uh, Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees to order. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to note that Trustee Cross is present by telephone, and um, we are expecting Trustee and Drummond and Trustee Lindstrom momentarily. Roll call and recognition of visitors. Okay, this evening's visitors include Dick Carter, Lance Collins, Sean Pytig, and Melody Rail. Thank you. The next item is the open forum. The open forum section of the board agenda is a time for members of the community to provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people plan to speak. In that instance, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must register at the door at each board meeting prior to the open forum agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers should be respectful and civil and not address matters related to individual personnel matters with the college. There are no registered speakers tonight. So the open forum is hereby closed. Next item is awards and recognition, and we have a few this evening. Dr. Sopcich. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Uh, tonight, we'd like to honor our women's basketball team, the NJCAA 2015 Division II National Champions. Coach Conrad, could you please come to the podium? <coughs> Coach, thank you for uh, bringing your team to this tonight. Uh, for those of us who watched every game, uh, it was an incredible experience and quite an accomplishment that uh, your accomplishment as well as the members of your team and your coaching staff. Before we get started here, uh, could you please um, introduce the girls for us? Yeah, you want me to introduce them all? Yeah, Every absolutely. One of them? All right, <laughs> there's a bunch of them. Uh, go ahead and step forward uh, when, I, when I call out your name. Kira Isaiah, Chastity Franklin, Alexis Brown, Kelsey Barrett, Emily Work, Shelby Dahl, Braille Fields, Katie Jones, Brooke Vaughn, Michaela Ross, Janae Barnes, Erica Nelson, Nika Wheeler. Those are the players. Our staff that's here is uh, Coach Bolin, Josh Bolin, Coach Strong, Dave Strong, Coach McCree, Felipe McCree, Coach Moore, Carlos Moore, and Coach Sydney Sassaman is actually not here today. She had to, uh, had to do some stuff at home back in Garden City, but uh, she's another uh, big part of our staff. That's our team. All right. <laughs> Coach, we're going to go into a little bit more detail here tonight because we all know it came down to the last seconds of the game. And, and you did had some coaching wizardry uh, on the court, and the players did a fantastic job. Um, what if we run this uh, for a few seconds to kind of set the get the atmosphere up, and then, Coach, we're going to ask you to diagram the play on the whiteboard, and uh, and then we'll take it from there. Okay? So, Terry, you want to press this and get get things going? Okay. Well, for the first first thing is you guys got to understand we got a full timeout, and okay, so, there we go. For, for most people that don't think they're a full, they think a full timeout's a long time, it's really not. We had, by the time the players get to the huddle, we probably had 35 seconds. And so what I first did, I came away from the huddle, and we had a couple choices on what we wanted to run. And one thing I wanted to run was something we used to call Blue Jay that we didn't put in with this team, because this team was kind of interesting. They, the more things we put in, the more stuff they would forget early in the year. So, <laughs> So we, we, we kept it real simple with this group this year. Didn't run a, a whole lot of sets. We kept it extremely basic. Um, and so we didn't have Blue Jay in, but I got to thinking in that huddle, what Blue Jay was really good in the past, it had some downscreen ball screen action. And then, I, and then I thought, you know what? This group has also been a little suspect with impromptu stuff just you know, on the fly on the chalkboard. Isn't that right, Lex? Uh -huh. so, so I thought we're gonna go real simple with an, with an isolation play we've ran over the years um, that we hadn't run a whole lot this year. And then it came down to which kid, is, which kid are we going to run the, run the play for? Now, excuse me, Coach. Could you diagram that for us up on the board? <laughs> yeah, I will. Yeah. Yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah. OK, so I'm going to show you. I'm going to show everybody. Basically, what it, what it is is a box set. Point guard's here. 
You got a player here, player here, player here, and the kid you want to make the play is right here. And again, we had, I don't know if we even ran it this year, honestly, uh, but we run it a lot in the past. And we, we called it, we, in the past, we called it ICE, and whoever, whoever the name we called, they were the star, okay? So the ball's coming in, and you send your players this way, sprint them out that way, and you got all the players on this side of the floor, and then this guy just cuts hard to the elbow, and then we hit him, and it's just an isolation play for that kid to make a play. So it's really simple, and there's not a lot of ways to, to kind of screw this up. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so in my mind, and again, I had 30, probably 15 seconds to make these decisions, because then I had to go in the huddle with these guys. And so I decided we were going with, that, with this play here, and, and then, and then there's a decision of who, who do we run it for? Who, who's the star? And Nika Wheeler had been the best player in the tournament, the entire tournament. Uh, Eric and Nelson can, can really make plays with the ball in her hands. But ultimately, I just had a hunch that, that Lexus Brown was a kid that wouldn't be afraid. Not that you'd be afraid, Nika. Okay. But I just thought she'd make a play. I just, I just had a feeling she was going to get it done. And Lex doesn't get nervous. She, she doesn't really get nervous a whole lot. So there she comes. If, if you look at me, like I'm continually looking around to make sure it's real, and, <laughs> and I'm continually looking around to see did, they, did, the, did the clock, did we have enough time? I, I, it took one of my assistants tackling me from behind and saying we just won it for me to be like, yeah, we actually did. So it was a pretty, uh, pretty amazing moment and a, and a real tribute to, uh, to these guys for sure. That's great, Coach. Thanks a lot. Carl, I think you have an award presentation. Let me give you a little bit of background on how fortunate we are to have Coach Conrad here. And I'll, I'll give you the history. In uh, the summer of 2008, Ben Conrad was introduced as the new women's head basketball coach following Debbie Carrier. In seven seasons at Johnson County, he has a record of 207 and 32, which is an 866 winning percentage, which is Unbelievable. He's led <coughs> program to over 30 wins in six consecutive seasons. He is the only coach in the Jayhawk Conference history to make that claim. Jim Littell, who is currently the head coach at Oklahoma State University, uh, did it four times. So that kind of gives you how good he really is. This season, Ben led the Lady Cavaliers to the national title with the 66-64 the win over the top seed at Parkland and finished the year with a program record mark of 34-2. The win over Parkland also gave Ben his 300th win as a collegiate head coach. He was named the coach of the tournament and recently honored nationally the 2015 Spalding NJCA Women's Division II National Coach of the Year. Ben has also won the Jayhawk Conference three times, finished as the number one or two ranked team in the final poll four times, and reached the national tournament four times. He also became the first coach in the program's history to be selected the Jayhawk Conference East Division Coach of the Year following the 2009-10 season. He also earned that honor following the 11-12, 12-13, and 13-14. Through seven seasons at Johnson County, Ben has coached 11 NJCA All-Americans, nine WBCA All-Americans, four national tournament selections, one national tournament MVP, 26 All-Region 6 performers, and 18 All-East Jayhawk Conference, including two conference MVPs. Even more impressive, Ben has helped 36 of his players 
at JCC earn a scholarship to four-year schools, including 13 to the NCA Division I program. Join me in congratulating Ben and the job that he's done for us. I will also add he's expanding his ability and he's coaching youth uh, baseball, so hopefully he'll live through this summer and uh, still be coaching with us next year. Thank you. Coach. The, uh, I had the chance to be at the games, and I also had the chance to uh, sit in the press box for a moment. And uh, the announcer said, asked me if I thought we had a chance to win. This was probably in the second game of the tournament. And I said, well, um, and having played a little bit of basketball, our coach always said, and I know, ladies, you've heard this, if you play good defense, you work hard, and be patient with your offense, and it does help when the ball goes in at a timely moment, <laughs> you'll have a good chance. Congratulations. Ben, thanks to you and your coaching staff and for all the, 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 the girls for representing Johnson County in the best way possible. We get a lot of compliments. Um, on our, the class of our team and, and how you play the game. So thank you. And also Carl and Pam, um, I've heard from other uh, presidents um, whose teams participated in the tournament and they, were, they couldn't say enough good things about how you guys managed that tournament. So thank you very much. It's really, really appreciated. Hey, Nika, Nika. We're, step up to the microphone. Where are you going to school? Uh, I'm not sure yet. Like, I have two more visits to go to. So. Where at? Uh, Can you disclose that? <laughs> Loyola Chicago and Eastern Carolina. Oh, that's terrific. Where did you play in high school? Uh, William Prisman. That's a great <laughs> school. Great school for basketball. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks, Nico. <laughs> You're President Sopcic. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Corb, follow that one. Okay, well, well I'm going to try. I, um, I would like to invite Mike Souter, Debbie Rulo, and Jeff Hoyer to come forward, please. We are recognizing uh, these three leaders from Continuing Education with an Exemplary Team Leadership Award. This award is um, sponsored by the Chair Academy, and Mike and Jeff and Debbie, the award was officially um, granted at the Chair Academy Conference in Seattle just last week. Um, but they were given this award because of their exemplary leadership in leading the continuing education team in redesigning some processes using metrics and evaluation criteria. They did that by managing not only the processes, but the people that had to implement those. And they have done an excellent job of working together to bring that division together to accomplish that. And so that's why they were recognized for this award. Congratulations. Thank you very, very much. Are any of them leaving for a D1 school? <laughs> well, we're Come getting around. ready to show their video. Okay. Just a minute. <laughs> okay. Okay. Next, um, we have the John and Sue Ann Roosh Excellent, Excellence Award winners. And um, the League for Innovation started this award in 2012. And the award is open to League Alliance member institutions, and it is to celebrate outstanding contributions and leadership by community college faculty and staff. And we had two faculty members that were recipients of this award. They received it um, at the League for Innovations conference back in the first part of March in Boston. 
Um, so that was the official recognition. But we are recognizing Allison Smith, who is Associate Professor and Chair, Art History and Humanities, and Jason Gray, Associate Professor <coughs> in Hospitality Management. And the next award, I would like to ask Lindy Robinson, Ona Ashley, and Felix Sturmer to come to the podium. Uh, Johnson County Community College is the third school in the country to be recognized by the World Association of Chefs, Chefs Societies. Students who graduate with a chef apprenticeship degree will receive this WAX CC designation, which is a professional credential for the graduates, and it designates them as a commis chef. And only 36 schools in the in world actually have this recognition. So Lindy, Ona, and Felix are being recognized for what they did to put together an extensive application and walk that through a process that was over a year long to actually provide all of the things that we needed to do and show all the exemplary parts of our program so that we would be able to offer this recognition and designation to our students. Thank you. If I could just take a moment, Dr. Korb. Um, and while the uh, national championship for the ladies was very, very deserving and hard work, um, March Madness also applies to lots of other uh, activities and events. And so the faculty that were recognized tonight uh, in the three categories uh, with leadership excellence and with excellence in their programs really is a tribute, uh, I believe, to our faculty and the commitment they have to each of their departments. Uh, the community certainly should be proud of the uh, accomplishments of all of our staff and faculty. And tonight, you just, you just saw but four of those uh, recognitions. And those, those activities uh, occur every day on this campus uh, in the student and teaching uh, learning process. And so uh, I want to congratulate you and the entire faculty and the staff for the great work we do representing this, this college and this community. Thank you. Okay, uh, student senate report. Mr. Redmond. Is Mr. Redmond here? No Jeff's not. No, no report to you. Thank you. Uh, this is the, uh, April is the time we have our budget workshop and uh, is, a, is a reason why uh, we start the meeting at 4 o'clock in April, uh, an hour earlier than our regular time. Uh, the budget process is one that has received a lot of input from uh, departments uh, since last year, uh, the end of the budget development process. And tonight is an opportunity for us to uh, uh, get a budget workshop report as to where we believe we're going uh, in the next year. Uh, there will still be a considerable amount of work to be done between now, uh, but that leads us up to August when we have our public forum. So at this time, uh, Dr. Larson, uh, I believe you're going to lead us through the budget workshop. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Cook and members of the board and uh, members of the community here. I'm actually going to turn the bulk of this presentation over to Rachel Lears, our Associate Vice President for Financial Services and CFO. Um, <coughs> before she starts, I want to acknowledge Rachel and members of the entire team that have worked uh, very hard to get us to this point. Uh, as you know, we have several new players involved in the budget process this year. Um, we lost a great deal of institutional, institutional history with uh, Don Perkins' departure, and we've uh, at times forged our way through this, uh, and it has not always been easy, but um, I'm very proud of, of where we are. Um, as Dr. Cook mentioned, we have a very participative process. There are 120 budget administrators, um, and they have been extremely diligent. Um, they've been patient as we've asked them to think about their budget in new ways and to budget uh, somewhat differently, and they've been very cooperative as we have, again, been working with a new team of, of players. I want to um, also acknowledge um, not only financial services team, but also human resources and information services who um, are very involved in um, putting the budget together. 
And with that, um, Rachel will have a, some highlights in a PowerPoint and then uh, step us through some highlights of the budget book, um, the budget workshop book that we've put together. So Rachel, thank okay. you. Thank you. I know that you all received the budget workshop manual in advance of the meeting, but as Barbara mentioned, I'd like to kind of flip the order a little bit tonight, um, start with a presentation that kind of will um, discuss some highlights and some summary data from the workbook, then we'll circle back through, um, hit on some of the detail that's included in the book, and then take questions at the end if, if, that's, um, if that works for everyone. So um, the first slide here, we have just a couple of, of, of highlights of the budget process for the 15-16 year. Um, so one of the most important um, aspects of the budget for next year and the difference really, one of the key differences between what you've <coughs> seen in the past is that we've budgeted expenditures more closely to approximate our budgeted revenue. Um, in previous years, I believe um, you have seen budgets where um, expenditures were more than revenue but were anticipated to be utilized only at about a 93% uh, ratio. So this year, what we've done is, through our budget development process, asked the budget administrators around campus to really look back and rather than budgeting based on previous year's budgets, to look at previous year's actual spending and help us to get a budget that more accurately reflects where we think we'll spend versus a 93% or so estimated usage rate. So what we, where we think we've landed is a budget that's going to um, help us approximate expenditures at about a 98% ratio versus a 93% ratio. Um, the second thing, our capital budgets, um, as you've seen in the advanced materials, are about a million dollars higher than the 14-15 budget. So we have intentionally increased those and able to, be, to continue to be able to address equipment replacement needs. Um, remodel requests and building improvement requests that came forward through the budget development process. And finally, um, fiscal 16 is budgeted to be the third consecutive year of contributions to reserves. Okay, the next slide is um, a graph um, that shows five-year trends, and this is uh, uh, looking at revenues over expenditures, so your net income or loss on an annual basis, if you will. If you look at the first, the first number or the first um, bar over on the left-hand side, you'll see the fiscal 12 actual deficit was over $10 million. <coughs> By fiscal 13, that deficit was cut in half approximately and was around $5 million. Last year, fiscal 14 um, was the first contribution to reserves in five years with um, a surplus or contribution to reserves in the general PTE funds of approximately $5 million. The fiscal 15 budget that we talked about um, was budgeted at a 93% expense usage rate, so the budgeted contribution was around $2 million. However, the next bar where I've labeled that the 15 estimate is really where we think we're going to wind up. So now that we've got nine months of the fiscal year under our belt, we're taking a look at the actual results and saying, you know what, instead of a $2 million-ish contribution to reserves this year, we're probably going to be closer to five. So really a continuation of a very positive trend. And then the final bar on the right is the 16 budgeted nice. surplus, which is again around $2 million. So when we take a look at the actual numbers, um, we'll see what, what we have kind of on a summary basis. And again, we're just talking the general PTE funds, and this is just setting the two years, this year and next year, beside each other and really looking at what we have. So we have about a $6 million increase budgeted for revenues, which is primarily driven by um, what we're projecting to be about a 6.6% .6 increase in assessed valuation. Um, expenditures um, broken out here on the chart between salaries, operating, and capital lines um, for a budgeted total that's slightly less than last year. But again, we're anticipating we're actually going to spend about 98% of that versus 93 because we believe we've budgeted more closely to actual than we have in the past, such that the net contribution to reserves will continue to be about $2 million. At the bottom of the slide, you'll see I have in italics just a note. Um, and we've talked about this at the management committee level, um, that both budgets include a capital line of about a million dollars 
for renovation of the vacated OCB space from when the culinary program um, was moved to the, no, to the new culinary institute. So those dollars were initially budgeted for this year, um, but all um, uh, that we were able to encumber during this year was architect fees, so the construction will actually take place during, um, during next fiscal year. That's why that's being rebudgeted in the capital line again. Okay? Um, so in able to better clarify the 93 and the 98, um, on the next slide, I went in and said, okay, on the expenses, instead of 140 and 138 million, when you apply that 93 and the 98, are we actually going to be spending more? And the answer is yes. We're budgeting less, slightly, on a gross basis, but really anticipating that the actual spending will increase. And there are several reasons why. And we'll talk about those on subsequent slides. But again, I thought this was helpful and hopefully um, helps, helps everyone to kind of get to what the actual numbers are. Increases in salaries and benefits, primarily due to compensation increases and um, increased cost of health care. Um, operating expenditures um, increasing. Again, I've got some detail on subsequent slides and then capital spending as well. But again, it reconciles back to that approximately $2 million contribution to reserves um, for next year. Okay, so now we can talk about what some of these specific items are that we're looking and budgeting to increase for next year. The first being a placeholder for compensation increases, for salary increases of two and a half percent. That's included in the budget in the general fund. Um, the next bullet on here addresses funded vacant positions. Um, we do still have about $460,000 of, of vacant positions that are in the budget that are funded. Um, this year, during the year, there were some positions that became vacant and um, on the administrative side were reduced, and those were primarily in the custodial and information services areas. So you will see some savings in the full-time salary and full-time hourly lines on the administrative side. Um, the Affordable Care Act, um, our HR folks have been working very hard to quantify um, the likely impact of providing part-time health, insur health insurance for part-time um, workers here at the college and have anticipated that um, to cost between four hundred dollars and seven hundred thousand dollars So that has been contemplated in the budget for next year. And then an increase um, for employee medical insurance um, for, of about 7.2% as well. Within the operating categories, we did see an increase there in what we are planning or estimating to spend through our budget. Um, the first of those being um, costs associated with Senate Bill 155. Next year will be the first year that the budget reflects revenues and expenses associated with that. And again, that is um, providing free college tuition to high school students. Um, in post-secondary technical education programs and then incentives to school districts as well. So the college has a 50-50 shared funding agreement in place with the various school districts that participate in this such that we have budgeted revenue of about a million dollars from the state and then expenses or shared funding payments to school districts of about 500,000. So about half that, 50% of the total. So that will be reflected in the budget for next year as well. Uh, strategic plan initiatives. Um, over the spring and during the budget development process, um, the President's Cabinet reviewed and, and prioritized um, about $1.3 million of funding requests that came in for strategic planning items. Um, what was actually um, funded at the end of the day was about $621,000 of the $1.3 million. Um, so that has been included in the budget and primarily relates to expansion of web-based instruction and uh, marketing, facilities utilization, and student success um, specific tasks identified with each of those planning goals. So we've got a placeholder in the budget for that as well as contingency items. Again, this budget has about $600,000 of contingency in the operating line allocated between the three branches, um, instructional presidents and administrative and finance as well. So we've talked about increasing costs, but we also have identified some areas where we have seen significant savings throughout the budget process. Um, Part-time credit instruction, or what's commonly referred to as adjunct faculty, adjunct spending, 
Um, that budget has been decreased by about 3.9% or about $500,000 for next year. Um, what happened there was when enrollment um, was at its highest point in about 2011, that budget was increased and kind of carried forward for the next few years and, and wasn't really um, decreased in order to reflect uh, downward trends in enrollment. So that number has been um, adjusted uh, for next year. Flex credit benefits um, are uh, decreasing. And that has to do with the change to the employee um, benefits package for um, flex credit offerings for employees. That, that is decreasing um, in accordance with that change in, in benefits. The last three lines there are, are just operating lines where we identified significant savings through our process, consulting, postage, and supplies and materials. And again, we had 120, 130 budget administrators around campus really going through the back through their budgets and looking to where they actually were spending and adjusting their budgets um, accordingly. With regards to capital spending, we talked about the fact that we're rebudgeting that OCB space renovation at just over a million dollars. Um, we've also included some significant um, funding for other remodel and renovation and, and improvement projects, um, specifically at third floor men's and women's restrooms in the OCB. Um, various classrooms were identified for painting um, in our prioritization progress process classroom furniture and equipment. And if you looked at your budget workshop book, you saw all the, the gory details of all the welding machines, EMS equipment, microscopes, um, spectrometers, and all those, all those sorts of things um, included in the detail. Uh, carpet replacement, and that's primarily, I believe, in the library and in some of the gym corridors and investment being made there. And then ITP planning for information technology at over a million dollars, which will be further allocated between uh, the instructional and um, administrative functions. The last bullet on this slide um, mentions the capital outlay fund, and I wanted to make sure that we talked about that, that part of the reason for the increase in capital spending through the general fund is to help to continue to preserve the capital outlay fund for um, larger scale one-time projects. That half mill that's directed to capital outlay um, you know, we're being intentional about reserving that for next year, what will be roof replacements, masonry repairs, and larger scale lighting and HVAC um, projects. Okay. Um, the next slide is a look at reserve projections, and this, these numbers came straight out of the five-year model that was included in the workbook. Um, and really, the, the blue bars just um, are an indication of our estimated reserves at December 31 in each of the five subsequent years. And we picked December 31 because that is traditionally the cash low point during the year, just due to timing of tuition receipts and, and um, ad valorem uh, tax receipts as well. So um, we feel like this is a pretty conservative model um, as far as in the out years, being very conservative on increases in assessed valuation and <coughs> expenditures. Um, but you can see that um, in total, the projected reserve levels are always above $30 million, and then the red line, which looks at the reserve as a percentage of expenses, um, doesn't dip below 19%. Uh, and we've talked again at the management committee level about the board policy being 10% there, and then um, another look at the 16.5% marker. Um, which is the guideline established by the League of Municipalities. <clears throat> so I think these, these um, reserve projections are very positive considering those two benchmark levels. <coughs> okay. Um, the next slide that I have is, um, refers to one item that is not yet contemplated in the budget or in those reserve projections, and that is a retirement incentive program. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Judy um, to give us a little bit of additional information on this program. Okay, this um, is the retirement incentive program that we have discussed, but it would be a planned spending of reserve dollars, and so will have to be built into the, the budget. 
It's a, a health reimbursement arrangement um, where employees who are capers, full CAPERS eligible to retire and have 15 years at the college would be eligible to apply for it. And it would be based on um, unused, earned but unused sick leave and um, capped at an annual amount of 1,000 hours based on a, a 12 month employee. And um, it would go into a tax-free account. It's administered very much like a health savings plan um, and could be administered by a, an external vendor. There would be a trust established. Um, and uh, the participants, there would be a one-time window for applying for it, and then that, that window would close, that would go away. And also, the, for anyone that is eligible for it would not be eligible for the early notification award that people are now eligible for when they retire. We would have some options. It, it, a trust would be established to handle this, but um, we would have some options around how we would fund it. So we believe that we could take, because we don't know, the total number of people that may apply for it and be interested in it, we don't know for sure for how we're going to manage that as far as the numbers. We may have to, you know, ask some people to wait until a second year. We may be able to fund everyone in the, the first year because we really just don't know. But we have some different ways that we can manage funding that trust to where we believe that we would be able to put, um, you know, half of the total amount in the trust the first year potentially, um, and then fund the rest of it later, depending upon how many people we have take it. So we have some options around that, but the bottom line is, it is a planned spending of reserve dollars that we do not currently have built in, um, but we've talked about this. So. All right, I just have one final slide here and then we can go back through some of the detail in the workshop booklet. Um, and this really just speaks to the timing as far as where we go from here after today. We're unfortunately by no means done with the budget for next year. Um, no voting action will take place today. Um, at next month's board meeting, um, the board will be asked to vote on approval of a management budget for next year. And what the management budget does is just essentially allow the college to conduct business effective July 1 with the new fiscal year. So that's a, the purpose of the management budget. From then, we move into June. Um, and in June, um, the college administration will receive updated info from the county with regards to assessed valuation. And we'll use that to inform our legal budget. So as I said, right now, we have built a 6.6% .6 assumption into the budget. That number will likely change um, in a month or two when we get some updated info. But there will be no board action at that time. Um, that will happen in July, at which time um, the board will vote to approve just a one-page portion of the legal budget for publication. Um, that would es effectively establish the mill levy and put our spending restrictions in place for each of our funds. Um, the board may elect at that time to adjust the mill. At this point, the, the amount remains consistent with where it is currently, um, currently at um, for the 15 year. In August, at the board meeting, um, it will be a public hearing during which attendees can come and address the board with questions about the legal budget. And at that time, um, the entire legal budget would be voted on and hopefully approved, after which we would proceed to file the um, appropriate documentation with the state and with the county. And at that point, um, the mill level, mill level levy is officially formally set. Um, but then, as everyone knows, in October, November, um, the county will provide the final assessed valuation for 2015 that will be applied to the tax bills. At that time, they could potentially slightly adjust the mill, depending on where the valu assessed valuation comes in, it would be a slight adjustment. Um, for example, if the assessed valuation was slightly lower, they would adjust the mill slightly higher to reflect the net change. So those are my final comments about the timeline and this presentation. At this time, I would like to go back to the workbook just to touch on a few slides um, and then have some time for questions, hopefully. Um, so we'll start here. Um, just a quick mention um, of the mission value, mission and vision statements, 
and the core values of the college that were identified last year during the strategic planning process. Um, we felt like it was important to put those in here as um, a reminder of the importance of the budget allocate the resource allocation or the budget process um, in informing the strategic plan and in continued efforts to kind of link our planning and budgeting going forward. Um, I'll skip over the next page, which was the budget guidelines set back in December and um, move forward here to this 10-year um, look back at enrollment history. Um, I think this is interesting. Again, it, it reflects um, information which a lot of you have seen before, um, most notably here with the peak in credit hours that I mentioned earlier happening in the 2010-11 academic year. Um, so we've got the numbers up here, percent change, and then looking at it in a graphic format um, at the bottom of the sheet. We are projecting flat credit hours um, for next year at 338,000, a flat amount with where we're at currently in the 14-15 year. The next page discussed the 10-year history of assessed valuation and the mill levy. Um, again, the 6.6% projected increase for next year. Um, we've got the numbers here and then um, a line graph to illustrate the significant increase there. The mill levy amounts remaining fairly consistent over time. <coughs> Next page is a pie chart, really just looking at the sources of revenues. And so I think the big takeaways from these two graphs when you look at last year versus this year are the increase in um, the ad valorem tax revenue. From It was approximately 54% of the college's revenue source last year. It'll be about 55 this year. And then um, in the opposite direction, the state funding um, decreasing from 16% of total revenues to 15%. A look at expenses, again, we've talked about some of the fluctuations um, in detail, but when you're looking at total expenses for the college, salaries and benefits were 78% of the budget last year. They'll be 77% next year, a decrease of 1% there, and then an increase in capital spending, which we talked about earlier. Um, page seven is just to look at our unencumbered cash balances. And we, we looked at the cash reserves on the bar graph earlier, but that was as of December 31 on an annual basis, the, the traditional low point. This is a more of a monthly look. So you can kind of see the peaks and valleys. Again, we talked about the timing of tuition receipts and, and tax funding um, causing the um, ups and downs during the year. I think the most important takeaway from this graph is that the green line, which is fiscal 15, um, exhibits a very positive trend um, for, as far as an encumbered cash on a monthly basis compared with the last two years. Um, the next chart, which is on page eight of the book, is a snapshot or a look at our total um, staffing going back again 10 years to 2006. So the 2015 is um, obviously where we're at right now. I wanted to point out that for the budget for next year, we have not budgeted any additional positions. Um, so we'll be holding flat at eight, 1,894. Um, again, I think it's, it's interesting to note the, at the bottom the comparison of where we're at now versus um, 2006, down 99 positions in total. And um, this year compared to last year, um, down by approximately eight positions. Uh, page nine is a look at the um, impact of our increase in credit hour, in tuition per credit hour. So as we've said, we've gone up by $3 per credit hour for in-state residents. I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong, I skipped one, didn't I? Let's go back to page nine, sorry about that. This is a look at the taxes for average residents. So we talked about the increase in appraised value um, and then with the flat mill levy, the actual change in taxes on an average residence, it's about $14. Now, sorry about that. The next page, 10, is the impact on students of the change in tuition price per credit hour. So um, moving from, three, from 88 to $91 per credit hour, um, in uh, the county for residents would be an equivalent of about $90 a year for someone taking 30 total credits over the course of the academic year. Then we've got the out-of-state, the other Kansas County and the out-of-state rates published here as well. And then for comparative purposes, 
um, we have provided the info for KU, K-State, and then um, Metropolitan and Kansas City, Kansas Community College. Page 11, I thought this was very interesting data as well. This is a survey that's compiled annually by the College Board, and it's looking at total tuition and fee cost um, for the past six years um, for each state, average state tuition and fee costs. You can see Kansas down here, 44th out of 50. Um, but the total cost there of 26, 28 um, is right in line um, with our total cost for uh, 30 credit hours per year. So I think that's a statement um, about value uh, for sure. Um, and then finally, this is really the last slide that I wanted to talk about. This is just a summary slide. We have focused so much on the general and PTE funds through the presentation and talked about the changes there. But this really lays out the other funds um, that make up the college's total financial picture, including the capital outlay fund, which I spoke about, um, but also um, special assessments, adult sub, motorcycle, truck driving, um, auxiliary enterprises, which is the bookstore and dining services. Um, and then the student activity fund, and then the various other restricted and grant funds that we have. So that's kind of a snapshot um, of the revenue and expenditures projected for each one of the additional funds. All that information is included in the legal budget as well. So um, that's really where I was planning to stop. Um, the additional information in the workbook is an updated printout of that five-year model, and as well as a lot of detail from our capital schedule on um, equipment replacement. Um, so um, at this time, I would you know, open it up for uh, any questions or, or any additional information that you'd like to have, um, and we can and go from there. Rachel, thank you very much. Uh, Barbara, do you have anything else to add? I do not. Again, we, uh, we have a lot of detail uh, in the book that you are welcome to uh, review uh, at any point. Uh, we want to be as transparent as possible. You have information about budget changes at the departmental level, and you have information about budget changes at the, what we would call account level. So what is the change in um, budget for uh, supplies and materials from year to year? And then, as Rachel said, uh, multiple pages of our capital schedule. Um, it's been, a, there's a lot that goes into this in terms of the prioritization, especially, um, I'd say, uh, Andy Anderson and all the deans going through, um, again, various requests to um, bring us to this point. So again, I, I thank them and we are open to questions. Rachel, uh, your last comment at the end, when you said uh, the data is updated uh, in the workbook, isn't it updated to the date at the top of the document? Uh, yes. Or did I misunderstand that there's yes. different data? Um, you're talking about the five-year model? When you said it was updated. Um, was that updated? As of the day that I printed it, yeah, April 7th in this okay. situation. Okay. Very good. Uh, Trustee Musil. Even though I indicated I had questions, but I do. <laughs> well, a couple, you know, go, going through this is very detailed. Um, I'd make a couple points, I guess. One thing that we didn't, I couldn't discern from this that you pointed out in your first slide was the, the change in part-time our adjunct faculty number, which was three point something percent and uh -huh. a million plus dollars. Okay. And you indicated that, and I, I want to make this broader because I don't want to just discuss that, but we hired on adjuncts during the period when, in the recession, when enrollment went to its highest level, which was, right. I think, 2010, 2011. Yes. And now we are adjusting it for 2015, 2016. So who is it that looks at those numbers between that five-year period to say, we should be ramping down just like we would ramp up based on enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know who, you know, it, it's, it just seems like that's a big chunk mm -hmm. to do in one year when our enrollment dramatically dropped in 12, 13, and 13, 14, and now we're kind of holding it steady. So that, that's my first question, I guess, is when on any budget category, who's responsible, a dean, department chair, a budget administrator to say, you know what? we need to, things have changed and we should be budgeting differently next year. Uh, the deans uh, watch that every semester as we're enrolling, we, we try and anticipate how many sections we'll have, how they'll be staffed, and, and so it is a, 
uh, a monitoring process. The very first year was the enrollment started to decline. Uh, again, there, we were very cautious because you're never quite sure uh, what the numbers are going to be. Uh, but that is something that the deans look at uh, every semester as they're building the budget, uh, trying to anticipate what the needs will be. Uh, and, and so there, the first couple of years, actually, we probably carried more for, forward in the adjunct line than we needed, uh, but we weren't sure where, what the numbers would be. Uh, now that the trends are pretty clearly established and we, I think, feel comfortable with the numbers, uh, we, you know, we adjusted our lines to, to show that. But yeah, the deans watch that very closely. One of the benefits, I mean, what you saw today is a new approach to budgeting uh, for probably since the beginning. We did a 7% variance, which quite frankly is, is it, it worked well for the organization, but it's rather extraordinary. Now with this budget, just a little bit more closer to reality, we'll be able to better manage that budget and keep our eyes on it, make, a, make adjustments throughout the course of the year. Um, it's definitely, for the first year, it was a great step in the right direction. But what you're saying then is that if we looked at the percentage actually expended in part-time faculty in the past years, it wouldn't have, it would have been lower than the 93%, and so this big drop off isn't as dramatic as it looks in our new budgeting format. Is that That's fair? correct. Yes. The 93% is on average, so I, some lines are right. spent much closer to that and, and some lines are significantly right. under, so. Well, I think our goal here is to be more agile both, both ways. When we need Absolutely. more faculty, let's get them, yes. and when we don't, let's, you know, because we're going to be responsive to our enrollment. So right. um, I just want to point out something on reserves before Mr. Carter gets up here. But, you know, our reserves that we're going to add next year at a little, I think a little over 2 million, that's about 1.4% of our total expenditures will go into reserves. So it's a, it's a small amount. Our total reserves over those five years are about $30 million. I think they, they're above $30 million each year. If I did the math right, we have about a $13.5 million a month mm -hmm. hit for salaries, benefits, and operating expenses. So our reserves are at about two months mm -hmm. of our expenses. So when people in other cities in this state that start with T, Topeka, look at reserves and talk about operating like a business, I think it's important for us to realize we have two months worth of reserves to keep the lights on and to keep the 77% of our expenditures that go to people right. to keep them around. Um, and in the slide you showed where it jumps up by month, it was down closer in the low 20s as of December in the past couple years. Yes. So we had less than two months worth of reserves. Um, you also mentioned that we are, I think Barbara or Judy mentioned, some of those reserves that we have in there, we're gonna have to spend down on the retirement incentive program. So we actually, plan our budgets for more than one year. We're kind of thinking in the future, don't we? So that's another reason to use reserves and have them there if you want to run like a business. Um, now, on our capital issues, again, we're expending another million dollars over past years, but that's, we still only spend 4.9% of our expenditures on capital items, right. I think. So I think those points just show that we're still being very careful in what is in the budget next year and for people that think we're being profligate in our spending habits uh, they can't document that with any data um, i'll just note that in our five-year plan tuition will go up from 72 dollars in 14 15 to 87 dollars in 1920 which is a 20 percent increase in tuition for our students um, we're at the same same level of enrollment now that we were in in 2006, 2007, so our obvious way to do better is to get more students enrolling and, and paying their credit hours. I, I was surprised in the employee benefits on page 18, the, the budget for 14-15 is 28,500. The budget for 1920 is 29,900. Um, about a $1.4 million increase over five years. That seemed low to me given the, the uncertainties that we have, and is that just Again, a best estimate. I'm sorry, which I'm page on page 18, the employee benefit portion of the general PTE expenditure. Yeah, some of yeah. that mm -hmm. begins with the, I'll say, the calibration or recalibration for 1516, because if you look at oh. the budget okay. for 1415, it's 285, and then 1516 drops to 25. So it's, a, it's over a $4 million increase over those yes. four years. Yes. Okay. That, 
apples to apples is going to be hard for this year. Final thing, on page nine, you list the average appraised value of a home at 250000 Yes. And you calculate the taxes on that. Mm -hmm. If I look back at page 21, the average home cost on page 21 is 240000 for 15 16. Okay. I think you picked up the number from 2019 20. Oh. oh, you know what? So, no, what page nine is what's correct. What is not updated is what's on page twenty-one in the five-year model. So that so page twenty-one, the two thousand fifteen sixteen average home value would be two hundred and fifty thousand. That should be two hundred and fifty instead of two hundred and forty thousand five forty-two. So it went up twelve thousand dollars in one year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the number so, the numbers that are on page nine are correct. So the average home in Johnson County will pay fourteen dollars more in taxes. Yes. In 2015-16, over 14.50. Correct. That's okay. based on the information that we received in February from the um, county appraiser's office. Thank you. Appreciate Other it. questions? Other questions? Uh, just a comment. When you talk about the $12, uh, if we don't increase the mill levy, if we don't decrease the mill levy, we're increasing taxes on our residents by about 4.7 percent. So just so. We know no decision means we're increasing taxes by 4.7. Not saying we don't need the money, but we, we're budget is five million more approximately. As far as the spend, yes, the budget's actually down, but the spend is higher. Yeah, and that percentage, John, I believe, turned out to be. Let's see, the percentage it goes up as far as the spend at 4.4. That's also when we look at the second year. It's a, a, I think it's our best estimate of what the actual spend will be. As we get closer and closer, we'll find out. Um, but again, for, for a first year attempt, I think this is pretty good. And I, the 4.7 on the tax on the taxpayer, 4.4 on the spending, then the balance probably going to the capital account. Right. Uh, if that makes sense. Uh, another point I know that's always a point of contention with the faculty association is the the full time versus the adjunct faculty. But I think a, a case in point for adjunct faculty is what we saw happening from 2008 through now is when our, a lot of people don't rec realize this, but we're counter cyclicals. You know, we have more demands on us in our downturn, but then that demand goes away as the economy improves. And so instead of gearing up and hiring full time faculty when our enrollment goes up, and then have the enrollment go down and you're, you have those full-time faculty that you either have to figure out how to terminate. I think that's a good argument for maintaining a balance of adjunct during those periods to meet that demand. Uh, I think that's just good management and... Uh, uh, Other questions or comments? Rachel, Trustee Musil. I, I just want to make one more because I think we're going to get to it <clears throat> at the trustee retreat when we talk about the capital needs on campus and the aging buildings and and issues that we have. If you look on page 20, if I added up our total debt correctly at the end of last fiscal year, it was about $32 million yes. in total principal outstanding mm -hmm. on, a, on a budget of over $200 million. So we, I'm not advocating we, we jump into, into a lot of debt, but it's, it's a time to finance things, and our debt load is relatively low, I think, I suspect, compared to other uh, higher education institutions, yes. and it, it, so it, it, it gives us an opportunity maybe to look at ways of funding some of, particularly our capital needs, um, in a way that's effective for everybody. And if I could, you could probably go back a couple of years, and if you look at that capital line, you'd find that, ex that budgeted amount about $13 million. So over the years, we brought that down, um, but keep in mind, as, as Barbara's presented, we have buildings that are over 40 years, a lot of buildings over 30 years, so it's time to think really hard about that. What, another point on the, you had a chart up there showing our total revenues, uh, the percentage yes. generated from ad valorem and the uh -huh. percentage on that pie chart up there, I don't know where that, <clears throat> that was. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, it, you know, more of our, uh, burden is going to be placed locally on us. You see the ad valorem uh, went up by 1% overall and the state grant went down by 1%. I suspect that pattern is going to continue. So uh, we want the local control. We're paying for it. So hopefully Mr. Carter can represent us over there in Topeka to make sure our representatives know that we ought to be able to make the decisions locally that since we're funding well over half and with the tuition in there, you know, over 75% uh, of the funding for the college. So just a point. Very good. Any other comments or questions? 
Rachel, uh, thank you very much. Barbara, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate you laying out the timeline between now and then. Yes. And uh, we have opportunities uh, in May, June, July, and August to uh, pin this down. So study and analyze. And if you have questions, visit with staff about that. Thank you very much, Rachel. Mm -hmm. While uh, we await Mr. Carter to come up for the college lobbyist report, I was remiss in uh, acknowledging the successful election campaigns of Trustee Musil, Trustee Lindstrom, and Nancy Ingram is with us. And uh, congratulations to all for a successful uh, election. We look forward to <coughs> the board uh, reconvening in July. And uh, uh, congratulations on a great job. Mr. Carter, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I uh, saw the uh, agenda, I thought perhaps I saw your hand and the logistic genius of placing the uh, lobbyist report following the budget workshop so that finally I might have something that looks like good news. <laughs> um, but by comparison, I still believe that the uh, budget is probably a little bit better than uh, the comments that I'll uh, have to offer you today. The, uh, it has been uh, a slow month, legislatively speaking. The legislature adjourned on April 2 for their spring break. Uh, they will come back on April 29th. Uh, they've, they've taken a couple of days, and they'll add those on at the end of the uh, session. And so they're coming back a little bit later than they might normally. And at that time, uh, essentially, they'll be addressing the $600 million or so uh, shortfall. Um, that, uh, that faces them for uh, the next fiscal year, as well as truing up any, uh, any final expenses for, for the current uh, budget year. There will be lots of tax proposals that, uh, that we haven't even heard about yet uh, come into play. Uh, seven or eight of those uh, were introduced on the final morning uh, that legislators were in Topeka, and so there, have, there has been no vetting of those, of those bills as of yet. Um, I'm sure that we'll begin that discussion in earnest when, when legislators return on the, uh, at the end of the month. The, uh, the budget uh, is essentially um, agreed to, if you will. Um, the, the conferees uh, on both the Senate Ways and Means uh, Committee as well as the House Appropriations Committee have, have gathered and have worked out the budget differences. Uh, the conference committee report uh, is, is ready to go. However, legislators did not act on the, the report before they before they left town. I think that, uh, that there's probably several reasons for that, um, uh, and, and one being that uh, there has not been significant di discussion on the revenue side uh, of the budget picture. Uh, the governor uh, has indicated, as well as the uh, budget director, uh, on, on multiple occasions, uh, that there is no way to cut uh, out of the budget scenario that the state finds itself in. Um, there have been outside groups that continue to uh, call for cuts, and uh, even at this point, uh, we're beginning to see some um, turning of the tide, if you will, uh, that those groups also are aware now that, uh, that there may be a need to look at uh, raising revenue to meet uh, the budget projections for the state of Kansas. The Consensus Revenue Estimating Group will meet on April 20th. That's next Monday. That's the group that takes a look at uh, what the budget uh, revenues look like. Uh, not only for the current year uh, and in truing up the expenses for the remainder of the year, but they also look forward to what we can expect uh, to see uh, in, the, in the out years. Uh, that, that discussion, that report will play a significant role in the uh, formation of the final um, edition of the budget. I suppose the concern is that with the budget being agreed to, at least at this point, when legislators come back, uh, and the budget committees will actually come back a few days before April 29th to begin some discussions, uh, but when they come back, everything's really back up on the table. They'll, they'll open up that, that agreement that they've, they've already reached, and, uh, and they'll begin toying with some of the, uh, the items contained therein. I think some of the, just for purposes of what happens next, um, when legislators return on the 29th, uh, essentially we'll be going through conference committee reports. That means looking at bills that have passed one uh, house or another. Um, nowadays we talk about bills that have even had a hearing in a committee uh, are now subject for a conference committee report. Uh, we'll be placing multiple legislative items in those reports. 
sending those reports out for uh, one body to review, uh, accept or reject, and, and then over to the, to the next body. And that process just sort of repeats itself until we uh, go home at some point, hopefully in May. The, um, I, I say that because presently in the budget uh, document or in the budget conference is our piece, uh, which was at one point Senate Bill 93. Uh, and that, that would include Johnson County Community College in the GED Accelerator Program. Uh, that bill uh, fell victim to uh, deadlines, date deadlines, and was stricken from the House calendar because it didn't meet uh, the appropriate turnaround deadline. Um, you should be um, pleased to know that several of our Johnson County um, representatives on the budget committees have worked hard to get proviso language uh, into the budget bill, which uh, will include us in the GED Accelerator Program. That is presently part of the agreement. Um, the, the language is still out there uh, for the bill, and should the House uh, go on general orders, which we don't think they will, there is another bill uh, where our language will be amended into um, uh, a piece of legislation uh, that deals with uh, CTE programs and GED programs. Uh, but I don't think that the House will go on general orders. We're not sure if the Senate will or will not. Uh, so, so we have a, a long game of hurry up and wait. Uh, there are a number of issues still out there in the balance, and I'll touch on a few of those, uh, one of which was uh, a bill that uh, many, many institutions are already um, performing in this manner for some of their degree programs, but that is the degree prospectus bill, uh, which would require uh, colleges and universities to place on a website uh, the cost of a degree, um, the expected return on investment for what you could make on a degree. There are a number of things that really aren't taken into account for that particular bill, and I've reported on it previously. Uh, I think, if anything, the good news is that issue probably is not going to go anywhere for the remainder of the, of the session. There are a couple of other bills uh, that, that maybe will have a similar fate. Uh, one is a, a bill that that probably would be a legal nightmare, not only for um, educational institutions, but for the state of Kansas, and that's Senate Bill 175, which is the Religious Freedom Bill for Student Groups. Uh, that, that bill did have a hearing uh, after, uh, clear up until the last week that legislators were in Topeka. Uh, it has not passed the House. Um, it, was, it was passed out of the Federal and State Affairs Committee in the House. Um, I don't necessarily see that bill moving forward. It, it was heard in the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. It's not often that the uh, Judiciary Committee in the uh, Senate and the House Federal and State Affairs uh, Committee get together for a conference committee. I suppose it's possible. Uh, anything is possible in Topeka when it comes to legislation um, that, that seems to just uh, stick around. Uh, but that is, that is a bill that we don't think will we'll move forward, but we're keeping an eye on it. Uh, for the remainder of the, the veto session. Uh, another important bill is the um, in-state tuition for uh, veterans. That bill has been placed into a conference committee report, which we do believe will be acted upon when legislators return to Topeka and would grant uh, in-state tuition for, for those who have served um, our country. Um, there are a few other bills that are listed there um, that, uh, that I'll let you peruse at, at your convenience. I do think it's important to note that um, we believe that the elections bill will um, move forward uh, in conference. Uh, I think the first attempt will be to um, take what is not really a House position, but it's a House committee position, uh, which would be to move the elections to the fall of even numbered years. And that will be the first report that is run. Um, we don't know if the votes are there to, to accept that conference committee report. We don't think they are. We hear that they're not. Um, but, but we do anticipate the final um, the final piece of legislation will move local elections from the fall of, uh, to, to the fall of odd numbered years, if you will, and keep them nonpartisan. Uh, the, uh, the initial run of that bill did not speak to community college um, elections or community college uh, areas, uh, but the, it, they are included in the current version of the bill, and we do believe that uh, in the final analysis, uh, we'll be seeing fall elections in the odd numbered years um, for local elections. The, um, the other issue that, that is certainly something that, that we've been watching uh, very closely, and, and there were a number of discussions uh, as late as uh, up until uh, the first adjournment, uh, and that is um, uh, around the issue of capers. Um, there were a number of proposals that, uh, that were brought forward uh, that were on the table, at least as far as uh, having a conversation in the conference committee that would have spoken to changes in the um, 
uh, in the uh, formula for uh, CAPERS contributions as well as some that spoke to um, retirement payouts or vacation pay payouts. Uh, they're, they're in the final report that was signed, uh, the issue only speaks to bonding um, some of the indebtedness of CAPERS to the tune of $1 billion. Uh, that was B uh, dollars. And so we'll be bonding out uh, some CAPERS um, uh, obligations. Uh, that is all that was contained in that bill, and I think that's very important for many of the, the folks that are, that are looking at um, where they are in the CAPERS mix as far as retirement is concerned. Just a couple of other uh, news items, and, and uh, you've, you've heard this one. It's been in the news uh, just the past couple of days, and that was the, um, the announcement that uh, the Regents uh, CEO, President and CEO Andy Tompkins would be retiring. Um, they have since, uh, in, the, in the day or two following, named uh, his successor, and that will be Blake Flanders. Dr. Flanders uh, has been the uh, Director of the Workforce Development Program uh, at, the, at the Board of Regents, somebody that, that we've worked with certainly on a number of uh, issues related to uh, career and tech ed, uh, as well as other um, programs that are offered at the community college level. And so um, Dr. Flanders will be taking over the helm at the Board of Regents um, come this summer. And then uh, finally, uh, ending with a bit of good news, uh, you saw uh, the very first up this evening, uh, the women's basketball team. We've been working with uh, our delegation to develop some resolutions that will be run in both the House and Senate, and we're searching for a day when legislators return to Topeka that we can um, bring the team over, give them some proper recognition on the House and Senate floor. Uh, and so that, that will be um, by far the, the best piece of news that I have to bring you uh, this <laughs> evening. Uh, so I would stop there and see if there are any, uh, any questions that I might be able to answer, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Questions? Any questions? Trustee oh. Musil? We, I don't think I've ever asked you, on the elections bill that would move it to the fall, when would local officials take office if they're elected in November? Uh, I believe it's January 1 is the date that is in the current form uh, of the bill. And that, that date has been kicked around uh, on several, several times uh, and several different uh, times when a local official would take office. Has anybody ever calculated how many different positions would be on the ballot? in Johnson County on a typical election with the president when you go through the president and the governor yeah the election and all the statewide and all the judges and all the local officials and all the water district the answer is yes they have. yes the election <laughs> clerks have voiced uh, significant concern uh, about um, ballot logistics if you will uh, and being able to um, process the, the ballots in a manner that the current system is set up for both electronic and paper the only other point I would make is there's another bill that would force us to tell people that we hire a lobbyist and we pay him. I just want to make sure everybody that's listening knows that we hire a lobbyist and we vote on his contract and it's a public document and anybody can find out how much we think it's worth to have somebody in Topeka watching um, what the legislature is doing. So I don't want, I'm not at least a bit embarrassed that we have somebody who is advocating for this college up in Topeka. And so if, if legislators think that's important, they could come and ask us and we'd tell them how much uh, we contract for and how we go through an RFP process to find the best person we think we can get. Um, but it continues to come up every year as a symbolic piece of legislation that adds nothing to the debate and adds nothing to the transparency that we already provide at, at the college and that cities and count the county also provide. Trustee Sharp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question similar to Trustee Musil's. Um, he asked when they would take office. My question is how, is it currently in the bill, and I apologize for not reading it, um, how terms would be shortened or lengthened related to, for instance, some of the folks here were just reelected to a four-year term in 2015, which would come up again in 2019. But if we move to fall elections, would they be on an 18 or a 20 ballot? Yeah, there, there is a matrix that speaks to that. And I think that there is some concern or question that it, that it could be a constitutional challenge uh, because the legislature cannot um, extend uh, or, or shorten a term uh, of another elected official. And I think that that is one of the questions that remains out there that would be tested uh, at the court level. But it, it does, I believe, extend uh, and it provides for a mechanism for those that are that are up for office that when their terms should normally expire, it would extend their, their term by a few months. 
That Trustee would, that Cross. Would greatly affect Trustee Cross. My budgeting if I lost a salary for a couple months. Trustee Cross. Yeah, yes, in point of order, Mr. President, I, I defer to Trustee Sharp. I believe we pay part of Mr. Carter's contract out of the uh, foundation. Is that correct? That is true. Yes, that's correct. Good question. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to raise that issue. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sopcich. Dick, um, having spent the last couple of days up there, there was some talk about um, getting a letter in June requesting a, a I guess, a, a payment to Topeka. Have you heard any talk about that? Another I, one would be. Yeah, I one. haven't heard anything um, recently about it, but uh, there is that potential that uh, uh, because the payments come uh, twice a year, uh, we've already received a payment. Um, based on some of the recalculation of, of the way the uh, career and tech ed money flows, I believe it, it's through that particular program that, that uh, we might find ourselves cutting a check um, back to the state of, of Kansas, not, not unlike some of the school districts are, are figuring out with the new block grant formula. Because we did well, the, the $400,000 one, which means it could be another one. And then with regard to the $600 million loop uh, hole, um, there was the university's speculation. I don't know if it's official that they that they will not be able to raise tuition. Yeah, at the at the state university level, um, they have added a proviso. Uh, and, and when I when I use the term proviso, just just to make sh sure I'm clear, <coughs> a proviso has the uh, effect of law for one year. Uh, it is not considered a statutory change, but they're they're typically included only in the the budget um, bills. And, and so our issue at uh, being included into the GED accelerator program, we would need to go back and fix that um, again next year if, if this is the method which is used. In, in that agreement uh, is, is what Dr. Sopcich speaks of uh, that would freeze university tuition for a, a period of time. I believe it's two years based on uh, being a two-year budget. Um, and uh, and it would, I, I believe that there is an amendment coming or there 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 was something that was fixed that would allow them to adjust fees, but for the, from a pure tuition standpoint, um, they would, those, those line items would be frozen at the university level, which is, is really out of character for um, the body to do since that authority lies at the, at the Board of Regents, not, not unlike those of you that are, sit around this table. Trustee Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wouldn't say out of character for this particular body. It's not typically done by the legislature. Um, but I, I would, I would argue that it is in character for this particular legislature um, to come after higher education and and other u local units of government. I'd like to follow up with a comment Trustee Musil made in terms of who's listening in Topeka. You'll recall uh, about a month ago uh, we were concerned about the transient guest tax, uh, and so certainly having been with the Convention and Visitors Bureau, we were concerned about that impact having a statewide transient guest tax. And uh, Mr. Carter arranged for uh, some of us to meet with Representative <coughs> Kleb, who uh, was the chairman, I believe, of, of the committee that that was coming through. And I'm pleased to say that uh, Representative Kleb uh, took that uh, issue off of the bill at that point in time, and so I want to publicly thank him for that. However, at the last legislative uh, breakfast that the Johnson County Public Policy conducted, which is usually... Uh, uh, has maybe five or six uh, representatives of the Johnson County delegation in participation. Uh, for the first time that I can remember, uh, only one showed up uh, for the breakfast. And uh, some of the comments that were bantered around is that our minds already made up and additional input probably isn't helpful. So I think, Trustee Sharp, um, yeah, there are some unique features about this body. And uh, while we may become discouraged in persevering uh, with our viewpoint, uh, sometimes they listen, but apparently many times decisions are made as to what this body is going to do. So I just want to, again, reinforce uh, Trustee Musil's comment that it's important to have somebody in Topeka to carry the banner. And in the case of the TGT, Dick, it helped, and I thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Persevere. Tomorrow will come. Committee reports and recommendations. The first is collegial steering. I'm pleased to report that the collegial steering committee did meet on Monday, April 6th. Uh, we uh, we uh, had three really uh, basic discussions. Uh, two of them uh, were hopefully uh, positioned to help us with our board retreat in uh, April and on our looking uh, ahead into what's the next 50 years going to bring. 
And the first item that we talked about was uh, what instructional operational strategies uh, will we need to improve degree certificate completion uh, at this college in the next three years, but long term. And as you know, with uh, the Kansas Board of Regents uh, strategy of uh, having uh, over 60% of Kansas residents have a degree by 2020, uh, we, we had a very engaged discussion uh, about the challenges that the college has. Uh, it's not a new topic. Uh, the hour went very quickly again, but uh, I think it's important for the trustees to be reminded that we have a variety of students uh, in age, in need of program. Uh, we have a variety of students that have certain challenges. Uh, and as we know, many of them uh, have families to support. And um, when, when, a, when an issue arises, uh, like a broken down automobile or a problem uh, with uh, uh, maintaining the home, whether it be a, a water heater going out or a furnace not working, those are financial challenges, and for some of our people, then that becomes uh, the decision maker in terms of whether that, that uh, college experience can continue. So uh, I, I, I want the trustees to understand that I really believe our faculty is very sensitive to that. Um, I think our counseling department is, is very sensitive to those issues. Um, it's important for all of us to work together hand in glove to understand the challenges that our students have. Everyone, I believe, is committed to making sure that, that students complete a certificate or a degree and hopefully will advance on to further education that, that it's not just the end. Uh, we talked a lot about first generation students and the challenges they have, and I won't go into the detail, but um, just keep in mind that we have students of all ages with all kinds of needs, and uh, for some it's easy to become distracted in the sequence of their educational, of their educational plan. Um, we then talked about major issues, trends that will impact student achievement at JCC in the next 10 years, and again, some similar kinds of activities. Um, the, I, I'm pleased to remind you that I think our staff works very closely with uh, high schools in the county, with Career Pathways, for example. The 3 and 3 is another example. Uh, College Now is another example. Uh, we, we have dialogue. Dr. Sopchuk has, met, has, has visited, uh, I believe, all of the high schools now, uh, public schools in Johnson County. And our counseling staff and faculty try to be engaged at the high school level. Um, we continue to work on reverse transfer with our four-year schools. So, um, uh, again, I, 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 Trustee Musil, unless you have a comment, uh, I, I thought the hour again flew by very, very quickly. Well said. The, uh, the other item uh, was the issue of faculty chairs. Uh, that is a, a program that had started a few years ago. And again, the faculty has taken that on in a variety of ways to study the faculty chair assignment and uh, uh, are they as efficient and uh, is the process working as it was set out to be? And so we'll have a report back on that. Andy, I don't know if I've messed that up uh, well enough or not, but I, I thought good discussion that the faculty is involved with that. So that's my report on collegial steering. Any questions? Dr. Drummond, Human Resources. <coughs> Mr. Chair, it's my pleasure to pass it to the real chair of the committee, and she was there, so she's going to bring the report. Trustee Sharp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Trustee Drummond. The Human Resources Committee did meet on uh, Monday, April 6th, and we had an extensive conversation about uh, how the community college is responding to the requirements under the Affordable Care Act for part-time employees working 30, uh, 30 or more, sorry, part-time employees working 30 or more hours uh, per week. We are, uh, if, if you're familiar with how the uh, ACA works for those employees, we can either provide the insurance or, or the, uh, provide the opportunity to take insurance or pay a fine um, for each one of those employees. And the fine would be about $2 million. And we anticipate that if everyone took it who is offered it, it would cost us about $700,000. So we're going with the um, no-brainer choice on that, um, in addition for, for financial reasons, obviously, but also as a way of, of uh, we have a, a reputation for caring for our employees, and, and we think that's a reasonable and responsible thing um, to offer to those part-time employees. So we, we will be offering that opportunity to sign up for um, insurance. Um, we ex expect the cost to be between 300000 uh, for, for a max of $700,000. Um, so we had that conversation, and I believe uh, recommendations are coming later on that. Um, 
but we do have a, 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 an extensive list of recommendations, and I'd ask the chair if I can combine those recommendations, if I can. Any run. of the trustees uh, have any they want to pull out? Okay, proceed. Okay, I'll run through them quickly and give you a, a quick overview of, of who we're offering the contract to and or who we're signing a contract with in the um, percentage increase or decrease or uh, neutral of, of the contracts. Again, these are beginning June 1 of this year <coughs> through May 31st of next year. Uh, uh, dental, we are going with um, Cigna and um, Delta Dental for a 0% increase for this year. Uh, vision is through VSP and again a 0% increase. Group Life uh, will be with Standard Life Insurance Company with a 7% decrease uh, for basic life and a 0% increase for optional and dependent life. Um, short term disability was a 20% decrease. We're going with the standard and I believe we um, we, this was the year for RFP, new RFPs for those two, so we got really good decreases again this year. Again, 20% decrease for short-term disability is really good. Um, I'm going to skip Holmes Mur Murphy for just a minute, uh, the consultants that do our benefits work. Um, flexible spending management is a 0% increase for this year. We'll remain with, uh, go with AC ASI Flex. Um, group Medical <coughs> will be with um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City with a 7.2% increase. I believe we're up for a rebid next year. Re is that next bid. year we'll rebid? Um, and 7.2% 7, 7 increase is still very reasonable, I think. Um, as of June 1, those part-time employees will be eligible at about $55 a month, the same level for, for everyone else, um, for the employee. Um, quickly back up to Holmes Murphy. I, I um, our, if you look in, in our um, in the description, we pay them thirty-eight thousand dollars, which is um, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say this, but it's a bargain <laughs> for for the services that they provide for us, um, and we're again offering them that contract for this year. I, I've been thrilled with their work. They do a great job when they come present to us, and obviously, from the, what I've just read off, they've they've really fought for us and come in with some really good numbers. So. Um, with that, um, the Human Resources Committee recommends that the Board of Trustees accept the College Administration's recommendation to authorize the President to negotiate a contract subject to review by College Council for the provision of the, of, uh, the, the items that I just mentioned for uh, group dental, vision, group life, basic life, short-term disability, consulting services, flexible spending account uh, management, and group medical for the coming 2015 to 2016 year, and I would so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. You have each of the detailed of those uh, motions in your packets. Uh, is, are there any questions? Are there any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That closes my report. Thank you very much, Trustee Sharp. Learning quality, um, Trustee Cross, I think you've asked Trustee Lindstrom to give it. Uh, are you still there, Trustee Cross? Yes, please. Okay, Trustee Lindstrom. Trustee Cross, I hope I don't mess this up. <laughs> you do fine, and congratulations, Mr. Trustee, on your re-election. The Learning Quality Committee meeting minutes are on page eight, nine, and 10 of your board packet. As you will note, the meeting was held at 8 a.m. on Monday, April 6th to 15th. 2015. The meeting was directed by Andy Anderson. There were four presenters, and I will have one recommendation to make to the full board. Clarissa Craig, Associate Vice President of Instruction, presented uh, for review 16 affiliation agreements and 60, 64 renewal agreements for credit instruction, as well as 14 renewals for continuing education. Specific details and agency names are shown subsequently in the consent agenda. It was requested that the new and renewal agreements presented today be moved forward to the full board. The second report was with Claire Amy? Amy. Amy? Claire Amy and Tanya Wilson presented a memorandum of understanding between Johnson County Community College and the Family Conservancy Early Head Start. The Hersteiner Child Development Center has been selected by the Family Conservancy 
an area nonprofit organization as one of the child care facilities to provide early Head Start child care in Johnson County, which, ser which services will be funded on from a federal grant awarded to the Family Conservancy. Pursuant to the Memorandum of, Memorandum of, of Understanding, the cost of services will be reimbursed by the Family Conservancy to the Hersteiner child, Early Child Development, and they intend to recruit eligible families for Johnson County Community College student from the student population. And I would make a recommendation, it is the recommendation of the Learning Quality Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve for the college to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Family Conservancy for the provisions of and reimbursement for early Head Start child care services by HCDC, and I would make that motion. Second. <coughs> we have a motion and a second. Any questions? Any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The third presentation was uh, by Jay Antle, Executive Director for the Center of Sustainability. He gave an overview of sustain sustainability in cu the curriculum. Colleen Dugan, Professor of Nursing, presented examples of how nursing is, integrated, su is integrating sustainability in their program. Uh, by the way, the Johnson County Community College sus Sustainability website can be found at www jccc.edu slash sustainability. The fourth presentation was Barry Huron, Professor of Science and Chair of the Portfolio Process Committee. Uh, he shared the tools that are available to assist faculty members as they work on their portfolio process, a requirement for all non-probationary full-time faculty members. Portfo portfolio information can be found on the Johnson County website, which is uh, HTTP blogs, jccc.edu slash faculty portfolio. The online sites Mark uh, makes available advice on crafting a teaching philosophy, checklist, objectives, guidelines, components, descriptions, steps required, uh, portfolio examples, and frequently asked questions, etc. Faculty training sessions are on the calendar for every professional development day schedule. And also, uh, Andy also distributed copies of the annual review of faculty performance, uh, for the faculty performance form that deans may complete, must complete by April 15th of each year for full-time faculty members. I would welcome any comments for those from those who are <coughs> in attendance. Otherwise, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Any questions of Trustee Lindstrom? Thank you. Um, management. Trustee Musil. Um, I had an appointment with the flu on April 1st, so Trustee Stewart, in one of his last hurrahs, got to chair that meeting, so he'll, he'll do the report. Thank you. We limped through that meeting without the able leadership of Trustee Musil, and uh, <coughs> we did meet on the 16th. Uh, the report is on pages 11 through 22 in your board packet, and uh, there are two recommendations to be presented this evening, and uh, the first has to do with the request for proposal for multifunction devices or printers and copiers here at the college. Second bid is for additional mas campus masonry repairs. So the following recommendations are presented. And the first is, it is the recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the proposal from Unisource document products in the amount of $103,982.28 for multifunction devices, plus an additional 30,000 for potential implementa implementation of optional managed print services for a total expenditure not to exceed $133,982.28 for multifunction devices and optional managed print services. I'll make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Second recommendation is concerning the masonry repairs. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the low bid of $247,000 from Innovative Masonry Restoration LLC 
plus an additional $24,700 to allow for contingencies for possible unforeseen costs to, for a total expenditure not to exceed $271,700 for campus masonry repairs. And I'll make that motion. Second. We have a motion and, and a second. Any discussion? <coughs> Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, other reports, we, we had a very uh, thorough report from Carl Heinrich on the college's athletics programs, and uh, obviously you saw the national championship uh, women's <coughs> basketball team here tonight, and they, they accomplished great things. But I think the most impressive thing that I took away from that was the uh, slide that they had on the grade point averages of the student athletes here at Johnson County Community College, and uh, I think we can all be proud of that. They're, good grade point averages and there's a number of students in all these programs that are 4.0 students that are also competing so uh, I was very pleased to see that and I think our, our coaching staff needs to be commended for their focus not only on the uh, athletics uh, but the academic side of, of that and uh, I think we all be proud of that. Uh, Rachel Lairds provided a budget update and we had a thorough budget discussion here tonight on the budget workshop. We also reviewed, uh, Mitch Borchers provided the sole source report as well as a summary of awarded bids between $25,000 and $100,000, and that is uh, on page 12 of the board packet. Rex Hayes gave us an update on the capital infrastructure projects, and his report's on page 17 of the packet. And uh, Sandra Warner provided a quarterly update on projects and information services. Her report begins on page 18. And uh, that concludes my report, unless there's any questions. Mr. Chair. Questions of Trustee Stewart. Thank you. Uh, President's recommendations for action. We have first item is the Treasurer's Report. Trustee Lindstrom. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to present the Treasurer's Report for the month ending February 28th, which can be found on pages 30 through 43 in the packet. Briefly, here are a few highlights. Section 8 on page 39, please note that as of February 28, 2015, we had a book balance of $103.3 million with $16.5 million in outstanding encumbrances, leaving us with an unencumbered balance of $86.8 million. An ad valorem distribution of $2 million was received in March and will be reflected in next month's report. <coughs> Expenditures in the primary operating fund are within approved budgetary limits, and therefore it is the recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's Report for the month ending January, I'm sorry, ending February 28th, 2014, 15, subject to audit, and I would make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Sopcich. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cook. Uh, tonight we will reinitiate the lightning <coughs> round. And to get things going, Dr. Korb. Okay, well, I have a um, positive report on one of our key performance indicators. Um, one of those, as you know, is the persistence of students from and the different cohorts <coughs> from one fall to another. And so, we just got back the report that our 46% um, of our students persisted from fall to fall, so fall of 13 to fall of 14, and um, that's an increase of 1%. So it may not seem like a lot, but there's some significant things within that number, and one is that our first-time, full-time de degree-seeking cohort, actually 63% of them persisted. And um, that's a 7% increase. So that's our freshman class. Um, and so that's, a, that's within that overall number. And then part-time degree seeking, it was a 4% increase. So there was a significant number in that freshman class. And so even though the overall of all of our students was 1%, still positive movement. But so that's just one of the things that we're tracking. It was a positive report and we just wanted you to know that. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Dr. Larson. Yes, I'm continuing with the uh, budget theme. Uh, Trustee Lindstrom talked about our expenditures being within budgeted amounts. Um, you know from our earlier presentation that we've worked to not only what we're calling recalibrate the budget to expenditures, but we're really looking at controlling expenditures and ident 
identifying efficiencies. So I want to dive just a little bit deeper into some actual expenditures this year and how they compare to last year. Um, our total salary and benefit costs are down 1% uh, now as compared to the same time last year, and that is uh, including the, uh, the salary and wage increase uh, incorporated in, into the budget. Our current operating expenditures are down 7% compared to the same time last year. And some of the specific savings um, include $200,000 less on part-time non-instructional positions. This is not the adjunct faculty, but non-instructional positions. That's down almost 15%. Overtime costs are down 9% 9, 9 compared to the same time last year. And uh, as new employees are hired into the Group 2 benefit plan, our flexible spending costs are down more than 5% compared to the same time last year. On the current operating side, um, we've seen a 7.5% reduction in electricity costs compared to the same time last year. That's a savings of about $170,000. Um, we've had a 65% reduction in outside legal services, um, and we've had a $210,000 savings in rentals as we've ended some of our lease arrangements for uh, other facilities and consolidated some spaces. So we're, again, we're really looking to um, continue this trend uh, for next year, streamlining where possible without negatively impacting the student experience, but where can we, um, again, identify efficiencies, work smarter, not harder, um, and continue to focus on um, our students. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Andy, before you get started, um, the, <laughs> um, both Judy and Barbara's report reflects a lot of hard work across the board by faculty and staff. And I think with, re with regards to how we manage the budgets and with regards to what's going on inside the classroom. And that leads to those positive numbers. So we're very excited about that. Now, Andy, are you going to give us something warm and fuzzy here? It is pretty warm and fuzzy. Good. Uh, That's but good. more than warm and fuzzy, it's meaningful. Uh, the, um, the, the mission uh, to inspire learning, transform, transform lives, and strengthen communities uh, that was mentioned with our presenting our budget. Uh, reminds us about what's really going on uh, along with all the numbers. Um, the Enactus is a new student organization that we have on, uh, at, at the college. It's an international organization that connects students, uh, academic and business leaders through entrepreneurial based uh, projects uh, that empower people to transform opportunities into real sustainable progress for themselves and their communities. Uh, that organization over spring break uh, went, uh, there were two students and their advisor, Barbara Millard, went with the uh, Health Brigade, the nursing program to Las Pintas. You've heard about that program over the years. We've been doing it, I don't know, over 20 years now, I think. Um, the Enacta students went this, uh, this most recent over the spring break. Uh, and during the week uh, in Las Pintas, Mexico, these individuals met with 45 students and potential business centers at El Centro Integral Comentario to begin the development of a JCC business-related program in conjunction with the health program. Uh, the purpose of the initial trip was to become familiar with the products and to gain an understanding of their market. Students in the younger age group of that uh, organization uh, in, in Mexico are producing teas, older students in Mexico are producing soaps and lotions, a group of adult women are producing gelatin products. Uh, our students were meeting then with those students uh, to talk about how that entrepreneurial effort could be joined uh, together uh, and introduces our students to a real life uh, ex experience. Um, and, and, and in addition to that, uh, in addition to meeting with the students at, at uh, uh, the uh, Integral Comitario, my Spanish has gotten weak, um, the Enactus students also met with an Enactus group at the University of Guadalajara. During this meeting, they developed an agreement to develop a joint project between their group and, and the uh, College Enactus Club. This will provide ongoing assistance for the students to have a deeper understanding of local markets uh, for the JCC students. In the coming year, the Enactus group plans to work with the University of Guadalajara uh, as well as their own advisory board to determine how they might develop an ongoing JCCC business-related program uh, with those students in, in Guadalajara. Uh, it's an exciting opportunity, and, and it, um, 
a chance as, as this is happening uh, and something uh, people in Kansas City may not be aware of, uh, though they should, uh, the consulate, the Mexican consulate has moved from St. Louis to Kansas City. Uh, they've been on our campus a number of times uh, and, and underscore the international relationships uh, that, that we have to develop if we're going to grow the economy and prepare students for the, the cliche for the 21st century. Uh, but it's, it's an outstanding um, uh, experience to see these kinds of activities taking place. Uh, there's, a, of course, as usual, many more in the, the, the President's report that we submit every year. Uh, but this particular program was really outstanding, and I just wanted to highlight it. So thank you. That's great. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Andy alluded to the monthly report to the board, 35 pages. If you check on the last page, and 35 pages of of accomplishments and incredible activities that are happening here uh, daily on this campus. The last page, 34, there's a, a new section for marketing communications. It talks about the um, Know the Value, Love the Experience, <coughs> Experience campaign, as well as a new social media campaign called uh, hashtag pick JCCC, pick being spelt P-I-C. So you put a picture on there and it hits Facebook, Twitter, and all those types of things. Um, the last thing I'd just like to mention is um, one of the great activities that we have coming up is on, I believe it's May 1st, Friday, and, and uh, May 2nd, which is a Saturday. It's the American Indian Health Research and Education Alliance uh, will host its annual One Nation's Energies uh, Health and Wellness powwow in our field house. I attended my first one last year. It's absolutely an incredible experience. Dr. Sean Daly uh, does a terrific job bringing this together and um, Native Americans um, uh, doing their, their cultural dances and songs. It's a very, very uh, awesome way to spend an evening. So if you have the chance, I would suggest you, you attend. Next week, I'd like to talk about our, our next month, our Model UN team performance in New York City as they competed against 3,000 students from around the world. And I will tell you, under the leadership of Dr. Brian Wright, um, our students uh, not only compete toe-to-toe, -to -toe, uh, they win. They do a great job. So some good stories uh, that we'll have the next month. So thank you very much. Any questions of uh, Dr. Sopcich? Is, is this Saturday our free course Saturday? Do I have that on my calendar right? Yes. yes. What is that? Julie, would you like to? Uh... I mean, I, th I think this is a great community event, and it may be too late for people to see it on TV. But could you sure. share with us, Julie? Um, well, every other year, college holds free college day, and it's our chance to give back to the community and say thank you for their support. And so, this year, we're going to have an activity called Black History Month, and we're going to have all kinds of topics, 45 minute classes. We have, um, we were heading into 130 different classes, many of them with multiple sessions, and we're right at 1,000 people who have registered, and we expect walk-ins. Preston Sharp is teaching two of them on Kansas politics. And then topics range from culinary, uh, sports, business, social media, photography, um, dog training, horticulture, we have all kinds of things. So we're looking forward to that on Saturday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. Um, I don't believe we have any old business. Uh, one new business item that I've just added, kind of informational, it's this time of the year when we appoint a nominating committee for uh, officers for this board effective July and give them a month into May to, um, to uh, make that recommendation. I've asked trustees Lindstrom and Sharp to head up uh, that committee. Uh, so they'll be working on nominations, not just for the officers, but also committee assignments. If you have uh, interest uh, in any of those committees or special activities, please uh, let trustee Lindstrom and trustee Sharp know. Uh, next item is reports from board liaisons, faculty association, Dr. Williams. the scenic route up tonight. So. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to say that this, uh, it's kind of bittersweet because this is my last official report to the board. Um, 
things have been winding down for me. Uh, on Monday, I gave my last or led my last um, official faculty association meeting, I'm giving my last report tonight. Um, and I'll be introducing my successor, um, who, who is very likely in the room tonight, <laughs> next, uh, the next month. Um, needless to say, it's been, the uh, last few weeks have been a uh, time of reflection for me, and I've been reflecting on how it was I actually got to this place. And so looking back, um, that's actually a good question to ask <laughs> sometimes. And um, I found that you know, in the seven, there's seven of the nine years I've been here, I've been involved with faculty association leadership. Uh, first, for two years as the faculty association cluster rep for the biological sciences, um, then on to the, um, vi the vice president of the faculty association for two years. I'm just winding up my third year as uh, faculty association president. I've helped negotiate three faculty contracts, and so I think there can be little doubt that I value um, the principles upon which the union stands. And as you know, I think we all know that the full-time faculty make up the bargaining unit but the practice has been for the benefits of the bargain, so to speak, um, regarding salary and benefits to be applied across campus. And it's a reason for, I think, everyone, uh, bargaining unit members, faculty members, um, and, and every really one on campus uh, to support the faculty association and keep our union strong. And strong it is. Um, strong indeed as we um, are finishing, I'm finishing up my term looking at a membership um, that is as high as it's ever been. Um, looking at faculty engagement as high as it's ever been. So I'm happy to say in the, the years that I've served, I've watched the union grow and also now can turn it over to my successor in really good shape. Well, my three years as president spanned two college presidencies. And so in my reflections, um, I guess I can say in fairness, in hindsight, that th things started off a little bit rocky with Dr. Calloway, um, mostly because we didn't listen to each other uh, in the beginning. Um, until one day we had a meeting of the minds, and uh, we found that if we could just stop interrupting each other, uh, we agreed about more than we disagreed. In fact, I am proud to say that I now consider Terry Calloway um, a good friend. So by the end of my first term, however, Terry was announcing his intention to retire, and so it probably came as a surprise, especially to him, that one night I stood before the board and was trying to persuade him on behalf of the faculty uh, to stick around a little bit longer. Well, that wasn't to be, and instead we welcomed Dr. Sobchik. And so Dr. Sobchik and, and I hit the ground running with some pretty significant work um, right, off the, right out of the gate. Dr. Sobchik and I had an easier transition, I could say, and so when issues emerged that were um, sensitive, difficult, um, challenging, we discussed those frankly. And the FA welcomed his presence monthly. Um, so, and I know that Dr. Sobchek welcomed those times too, so he could continue those frank discussions with, with the faculty association. So I guess in the reflecting, I would say directly um, is really the only way I know how to communicate. And it's certainly the only way I know how to lead. And I'm happy to say that administration and the board seem to have adjusted to that <laughs> over the last three years. And um, I'm happy to see as I end my term that Dr. Sobchek is not announcing his retirement. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's still time, no. <laughs> I, I do have a few more weeks, but on to the main report. Um, the major task at hand is negotiations. And so negotiations are certainly in progress. Um, and while we haven't quite achieved a symphony yet, I can say that there have been many moments I can, as an observer, where it was clear to me that we are really all in this together. And so I'll give you a glimpse into one of those moments. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, I entered the room to find the dry erase board filled with numbers. Ron was standing with his dry erase marker in hand, um, fully engaged uh, in the discussion uh, with the board team. You could cut the tension in the room with a knife. And so from my view, it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> I mean, this was negotiations happening, um, and happening really um, in, at an intense level. I happen to enjoy the intellectual sparring that, that goes on during negotiations, and I know um, at times, speaking for my members of my own team, uh, that that has sometimes been difficult for them. But at one point in the discussion, uh, one of the FA team members suggested that, um, well, they, was, they were talking about the numbers, and then at one point, the, the suggestion was made that they break into uh, different rooms and talk, continue to talk about the numbers separately. So one member from the faculty association team 
um, asked innocently or perhaps profoundly, why don't we just all stay in the room and, and discuss the numbers together? Uh, well, they did stay in the room and discuss all the numbers together, but as it turns out, that question, why can't we, has shaped the comments that I'm going to make for the remainder of my report. In fact, I titled my report, Why Can't We All? <laughs> so um, I, I also recall the first time I stepped up to the podium and I noticed tonight, this administrator is in the audience. Um, the administrator said to me, I'm really happy that you are now FA president because I see you as a unifier. And I, I remember thinking that many times, uh, we all think we can be uh, when we walk into this role. And I think in times, perhaps I have been, at least I've tried. I've invited trustees to, trustee members to uh, faculty association meetings and um, events. If you look around the room, you can see, I think I counted seven, and hope I didn't miss anyone, seven faculty members who I've brought to the board meetings. I guess in part to unify, but more importantly to inform, because I really do think when people get together, um, those conversations can lead uh, to a better place. Well, with regard to the budget retreat, uh, or the budget, um, comments about the budget tonight, um, along the theme of why can't we all, um, I've made some observations, and I think that the taxpayers of Johnson County can rest assured that this board and this administration has a firm <coughs> grasp on the budget. And there were numerous comments about efficiencies and efforts to cut costs and to scale back and to make the budget work better um, for without sacrificing the goals of the institution. I think that we can all agree that investing in the faculty and staff who work here is both a good and a necessary thing. And I think that we can all agree that in addition to, as we've heard many times, the fiduciary responsibility that the trustees have to the community and to the taxpayers, that, we have an equally, that they have an equally important responsibility to the community of students and employees at this college now into the future. And since I'm on the discussion of a uh, topic of discussing responsibilities, I had, a, I had a conversation earlier today, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say something about rights. Because I spend a lot of time in my role talking to bargaining unit members about their rights. And again, I just today I reminded one of those who I'm working with in an advisory capacity that with any asser assertion of a right, whether it's management or association, that there should be equal time spent discussing responsibilities and that the one cannot be fully actualized without the other. Why can't we? Why can't we change the narrative? Fill our conversations with words like we have heard tonight or examples like we heard tonight where we celebrate winning teams or we celebrate winning um, examples like the ones that I'll offer uh, by students who had worked with members of the Counseling Center um, over the past few days. And a lot of this part was inspired by a management committee meeting where um, Carl Heinrichs actually was talking about the success of his athletes and pointed to a survey that focused on significant others, as he, as he phrased it, and counselors and coaches, how they play such an important role in retention and the persistence that we've seen documented as a celebrated um, increase in our KPIs um, earlier tonight. So here's, a, here's an example of a message that was sent recently to two counselors. Dear Counselor A and B, thanks so much for meeting with my son and helping him on his journey. You both gave him encouragement and helped him with understanding of his degree quest. A, you took time to discuss plans with him that helped him to sort through things and gave him realization of where he needed to go. B, your guidance will help with completion of a degree in the near future. You put him on track. I appreciate all that both of you did. Another one from another parent. We would like to express our sincere appreciation for the exceptional care of one of your staff members, Counselor C who continues to provide our family with amazing support and guidance as we pursue this endeavor of dual enrollment for our two children. It's a pretty lengthy message, but it goes on to describe how both a son and daughter are uh, currently being homeschooled, but they've taken advantage of the Blue Valley CAPS program and received Johnson County Community College credit, and uh, how Counselor C has provided uh, unprecedented advice on every, every aspect of their son and daughter's experience at, at JCCC, and they do such a wonderful job that they said, you may even see one of us back in the classroom in the future. So why can't we? I think we can all agree that Johnson County Community College is a great place to work, a great school to be a student, 
to be a faculty member, a great place to be a trustee, a CEO, a CAO, indeed a great place to be a union president. So I submit that the answer to the question, why can't we all, is that we can. We just have to listen. We have to stay in the room just a little bit longer. We need to engage in conversations a little while longer so that we can understand. So I thank you for your attention. It's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed every moment of the work that we've done together in my role as FA president, and I look forward to opportunities um, to work together with the trustees and the administration in the future. I do feel like I should close with a reminder and a gift, and so I'll just pass these around. These are um, I, am a heart, I Am a Heartbeat wristbands. Um, I mentioned last time that uh, Melissa Wells, one of our counselors, needs a heart transplant. And it seems like a lot of the themes um, over the last several weeks have been about contests, elections, battles of some type. And so I just, the reminder is, the gift is the wristband, but the, the reminder is that battles are relative. Worries can be placed on a continuum, whether we, have, we all have struggles, whether in our health, personal, professional. But M Melissa's <coughs> battle is lifelong, and so we can all better we weather whatever battle that we're facing if we weather them together. So all the best to you. It's been, again, it's been a pleasure working with you. Dr. Williams, thank you. Uh, any questions of Dr. Williams? Trustee Stewart. Uh, this may surprise Dr. Williams, but uh, I want to salute you for your service. Thank you. uh, we probably didn't always agree on things, but what I really want to applaud you on is your passion and something that you bring that is part of our mission here, but it's lifelong learning. You're an example of that. I don't know how many degrees you have, but- Seven. seven. <laughs> I applaud that, and I applaud the passion you have shown in that job, so. Thank you so much. Any other comments or questions, Trustee Musil? Well, I, we'll probably get another chance next month when you introduce your successor, but uh, I think in, in four years on the, on the trustees, uh, I applaud you probably primarily for the level of faculty engagement from the strategic plan and the continuing efforts. I mean, people have really, I think it's a lesson we learned after the Great Recession that we really are all in this together and, and we can't just build it and they will come and whether it's enrollment recruitment or other areas where the faculty has been uh, very active and I, I applaud you and I apl applaud uh, Dr. Sopcic for getting more information out to everybody, asking more questions and having a more informed discussion. I think that's been very evident in my four years and I really appreciate that. Um, you will be missed. Thank you so much. Debbie, thank you for your service to the association. Chair. Uh, Trustee Cross. Yes, uh, Dr. I, Williams, thank you for your service on the, on the board. And I just wanted to ask, with, with respect to the contract negotiation and release time, though this board doesn't always agree with you, could you explain to us what release time is and how that's useful <coughs> to you or your successor and how it helps the college and the administration? Well, that's, um, that's a difficult question to answer comprehensively, but I can narrow it to my personal experience tonight, and I know there's some parameters I have to be mindful of because we were talking about this very issue earlier today, in fact. Um, it's an item that's currently being negotiated with regard to faculty association president release time, and because it's contractual, it's something that and more appropriately perhaps belongs in the conversations at the table. But I can say that um, as I started to this conversation last month, I don't, I don't know that anyone, even my own officers for that matter, fully appreciates um, the nature of this role and how it's evolved over time. I can tell you um, I didn't completely um, understand <coughs> the, the demands and um, I think my particular approach is to use most of that release time to be available for advocacy because frankly it's something I think is probably the mo most important aspect of this role, um, and it's something that you just simply need time to do as issues come forward. How that benefits um, the faculty is you can talk down, for lack of a better word, you can explore issues and perhaps get the faculty member to a better place if you just unpack something that seems like uh, on the surface um, too difficult for the individual to, to deal with. How it benefits administration, um, 
and the college, I mean, frankly, we run interference, not just the president, but the association officers many times just to meet with faculty and hear them out and try to look at issues and work with um, whoever we need to work with, whether it's college council or administrators, deans, supervisors, HR. Um, so time, 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 it all comes back to time. And as a full-time faculty member who's expected to teach 15 hours uh, for our compensation, the um, amount of release time should be arguably proportionate to the amount of time that um, the individual speak, is spending with those issues. And currently, again, there's a contractual um, there's a contractual amount that's not that doesn't comport with um, past experience, and so we're trying to work out some of that um, at the table. And I'm trying to do my part to best communicate um, in the limited ways that I have to communicate how important that release time has been in my particular role and, and obviously to those who enjoy it across campus for the various kinds of um, activities they perform to justify that reassigned time or release time. Dr. Williams, thank you. And again, I'd say thanks for your service to the association, your service to the college, and your service to, uh, your service to the uh, issue of persevering um, over discussion of opinions of difference. Uh, I, I've, I've often said that when I was with the Convention and Visitors Bureau that if everybody did their task representing the hotel, the meeting planner, the CVB, et cetera, we're going to have differences of opinion. We're going to have conflict. We shouldn't be afraid of the conflict. We should be afraid of our lack of ability to resolve it. And so uh, I appreciate your leadership in being um, steadfast in presenting your case, realizing that there may be differences of opinion but your commitment to help resolve them. And so um, thank you very much for that. Uh, anything else? Thank you, Debbie. That's right. Thank Appreciate you. It. Take care. Wish you the very best, and uh, we'll be seeing you around the track. Yep. See you next month. <laughs> Johnson County Research Triangle. Ms. Trustee Musil. The Johnson County Educational Research Triangle Board met on Monday, April 6th. I was not able to attend, but the agenda included the uh, quarterly reports we get from each of the three beneficiaries of the one eight, eight cent sales tax. It included a proposal uh, from the universities, the three entities about how and what administrative expenses should be chargeable to the JSERT fund because it's not always easy with the universities to segregate those. Um, and it also included consideration of a request for proposal for communications efforts so that we can uh, do, a, I think, a better job of letting taxpayers know what they are receiving for the literally millions of dollars that are coming in each year for those three entities. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, KACCT has not met since our last meeting. Uh, we have had our monthly conference call as officers. We're planning for the next meeting in June uh, at Barton County Community College. Um, interestingly, we continue to be concerned about um, administrative leadership. We've had a couple of other presidents uh, step down of the 19 community colleges, and so I know we'll be spending time um, in June uh, talking about that as a statewide association uh, and also trustee development. Uh, we did not talk in the foundation about an upcoming event. I'd like to ask Trustee Stewart uh, to give an update on an upcoming event this weekend, I believe it is. Yes, Thank you. Brown. Council. Thank you, Chair Cook. Uh, time is running out for you to buy your ticket for the <coughs> annual Cohen series Saturday night. Sawyer Brown is here on campus at 8 p.m. in Yardley Hall. We've sold over 800 tickets. Uh, we have a few more to sell, but it's going to be a great crowd, and it's, uh, they always, these type of groups, really appreciate the smaller venue of Yardley Hall, and so usually put on an extra special performance. So all the funds raised, all the ticket proceeds go to scholarship and programs here at Johnson County Community College. So if you don't have anything to do Saturday night, come out. Go to the concert, support scholarships. Thank you. Can I wear my boots? You can wear your boots, you can wear your hat, whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, along those lines, I, I know that we all received a write-up of the uh, one of the recent events uh, at Yardley Hall of the ukulele group and uh, sold out. Uh, again, I would encourage the public that if you're not aware of all of the events going on at Yardley Hall, we're blessed to have a diverse uh, program of activities and uh, Sawyer Brown will be one of those great events. And Blue Man Group. 
Yes. Did you want to talk about that, Trustee Sharp? I, I would love to talk about Blue Man Group. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Blue Man Group will be here in January of next year. Jim Brookman's coming. We have an, just an awesome, awesome lineup. The Trocadero is going to be back. Um, check out the Performing Arts Series website. I highly encourage you to take advantage of this year's program. Thank you. The consent agenda is a time where we vote on a number of routine items. Does any trustee wish to pull any item off the consent agenda? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? A motion carries. We do have an executive session this evening. I would like to uh, entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing consultations with the board's bargaining representation in employer-employee negotiations to protect the public interest in negotiating a fair and equitable contract. The session will last 60 minutes. We would like to invite Joe Sopchik, Judy Korb, Barbara Larson, Andy Anderson, Jim Lane, Becky Centelvere, Susan Ryder, <coughs> Tanya Wilson, and Melody Rail. Uh, the uh, executive session will start at 620. That's about eight minutes from now. Uh, so I would like to entertain a motion. Yeah. Did I hear right? 16? 60. Thank you. 60. Thank you. 60. Six I would so move. I was hoping it was 16. Second. Musil, Drummond, and uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The executive session will start at 620. They're not. We have returned from executive session at 717. No action was taken. Uh, we are back in our regular session. I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you.